So, excellencies, distinguished guests, uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I want to give you good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on uh, location we're coming in from. I think by now we're all pretty used to the, uh, the Zoom meeting drill after more than a year at it. Um, I want to welcome you to the second day of the Global Symposium on Soil Biodiversity. My name is Alex Jones. I am the FAO Director of Resource Mobilization and Private Sector Partnerships. Yesterday, we had a wonderful opening of the symposium with a, quite a range of speakers and activities. Today, we'll be continuing with a plenary session for about one hour, and then we'll be breaking into parallel sessions. So for the, uh, for the first session here, we have a number of very interesting speakers, and we'll be focusing on private sector activities and contributions uh, to soil biodiversity around the world. I do a couple of, uh, of in-house reminders here. Unfortunately, uh, from today forward, we will not be having simultaneous translation. I apologize for that. Uh, there are cost concerns that we have to be aware of, so it will be in English uh, as of today, the meeting. So in the plenary session, we do want to focus, as I said, on private sector actions. We'll be having a number of interventions uh, from speakers that I'll invite uh, to take the, uh, the floor now. I keep saying the stage, but of course that's no longer appropriate. Uh, it's automatic. And obviously, Soils are in the global agenda and the private sector is joining our call for sustainable soil management and healthy soils. Um, my team here in FAO is working with many of these partners and we're very much expanding uh, the reach around this. Um, there are a number of private sector initiatives globally that it would be thought, we thought it would be good uh, to learn from some of them. Now, obviously these are a sampling. There are many, many interesting initiatives around the world. Uh, I just want to remind you that each of these interventions will be a maximum of about 10 minutes, after which we will have about 20 minutes for some question and answer time. Uh, you may want to already put some of these questions in the chat box, uh, or as we go through, raise your hand. I'll, of course, be going in the usual priority. So without further ado, uh, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Philippe Schaus, uh, who is the CEO of Moid Hennessy, uh, to come uh, and uh, forward to the floor. Sir, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you for um, allowing me to speak to this group. Let me try now to share my screen with all of you. Yes, here we are. So, uh, yes, so uh, I guess the beginning of the second day is about wines and spirits. So I hope it's a nice distraction in a certain way. What I want to do to you is really give you the perspective of our business, uh, which I would say is representative of the wines and spirits uh, industry as a whole, whereby we may have some aspects where we go a little bit further than others, uh, other uh, um, uh, go even further than us. Um, and, and, I, and this is not going to be an, uh, a presentation by specialists. I'm the CEO of my Tennessee, but I want to give you the business perspective and also the philosophy uh, with which we address the topics around sustainable development and biodiversity in particular. So let me get into this and uh, move to the next chart. So what is Moet Tennessee? Well, basically, um, we are winemakers uh, on five continents. We have 25 centuries old maisons. We call them maisons or houses of luxury as each of these maisons is a brand, but with its own production, with its own strategy. We have more than 8,000 employees, and we believe that we have a unique expertise in uh, viticulture and winemaking, and I'm going to come back to that. Uh, what are the brands which we have in our portfolio very quickly, so that you understand what I'm going to talk about later on. We have champagne brands, which you see here, like Dom Pérignon or Moët et Chandon or Veuve Dico. We have sparkling wines, which we produce in many parts of the world, including in China, in California, but also Brazil, India. We have a portfolio of still wines. Uh, we have still wine in China, Aoyun, but we have, of course, Cheval des Antes in, in, uh, in, um, in Argentina, or Newton in uh, California, New Mancia in Spain, or we also have two uh, estates in the Provence, uh, Rosé. And then we have our spirits, of course, starting with Hennessy, which is the leader, the world leader of super premium spirits. But then we have also whiskeys, vodkas, um, and we have uh, uh, recently we have even a tequila. So if you look at this, uh, the map of all these um, uh, estates, uh, viticulture and agricultural estates, you see that it really covers the planet. Uh, maybe with, with the exception of Africa, where we are not yet present, but we are well distributed in Europe, North America, Latin America, Asia, and Australia. 
And of course, each one of these estates is in different terroir, comes with different climate issues, uh, soil issues, um, uh, um, uh, pressure from uh, insects or fungus or whatever. So we are, we are of course, looking at solutions uh, and, and, and approaches which are, can be similar throughout the world, but can also be very different. Um, our terroirs, our soils, they are both our heritage and they are our legacy. So, of course, we are owned by LVMH, and LVMH, as you know, has very strong environmental commitments on circularity, on the transparency of the, the, the wear of the, the, the raw materials and, and the finished products, on biodiversity and carbon footprint. Uh, recently, there was an initiative announced, uh, you may have heard about it, called Life360. But beyond that, of course, Moet Hens is very special since we have this uh, particular business in wines and spirits and our activities, I would say, are anchored in eternity. Uh, some of the lands we are using, uh, we have been using for centuries. Uh, I mean, we are, we are in, if you take Champagne, where you take the land where we use, we produce Moet et Chandon, where we have been on that same land for more than 200 years. We have more than 6,000 hectares of vineyards and we are working, uh, uh, the, the majority of what we use is not coming from us, but from partners who are growers, typically small family businesses, which we influence, uh, develop, work with. And some of, some of these partnerships also go back 100, 200 years. And so most of what we do is grape-based. And that's why you're going to hear me taking, uh, talking essentially about grapes, about vineyards. But of course, when we talk about tequila or whiskey or so, we come... We have other uh, raw materials which we use, uh, agricultural products which we use to make those. We want to be an inspiring leader for sustainability in the sector of luxury wine and spirits and make a positive impact on the planet and thus meet, I would say, yes, consumer expectations, but sometimes more than that, the expectations of our own employees and partners and the communities in which we work. And we have tried to put this all together into one um, program, uh, which we launched last year, and which we called Living Soils, Living Together. So what is this made of? Well, there are basically four different uh, um, uh, access to that. The first one is about regenerating our soils. The second one is about reducing our climate impact. Then it's about engaging the society wherever we are, and lastly, Empowering, empowering our people, which has also aspects of diversity and inclusion and, and uh, things like that. I'm going to focus only on the first one, regenerating our soils, because this is what comes closest, of course, to the whole notion, or which includes the whole notion of biodiversity, which is the focus of this conference. Now, what you have to understand is that since we come from, we have, we're, we're running companies, which are 100, 200, 250 years old, these companies were founded by very important people like Claude, Claude Mouet for Mouet et Chandon or Madame Clicquot for Veuve Clicquot or Richard Hennessy who, who, who created uh, Hennessy more than 250 years ago. Look, these people from the beginning, they were already thinking about the eternity, about the soils, about what they would give over to next generation. So they were perfectionists not only in creating the greatest wines and spirits uh, of their times, but also in being able to hand it, handing it over to future generations of which we are part of today. So you could say that the sustainable development path is ingrained in the very foundation of all these maisons. Now, over the last 20 years, uh, there has been uh, enormous efforts to move further than that. And, and it was very much driven by the search for the best environmental certifications from the Maisons. And, and you may know some of them like the Viticulture Durable uh, uh, certification in Champagne, or there is, a, there is a Napa Green Land and Winery certification in California, etc. Bodegas de Argentina in, in, in Latin America. So this has been uh, the big focus, uh, I would say the last 20 years, and then more recently, we have tried to go beyond that and uh, take uh, decisions like uh, uh, grassing uh, uh, the vineyards uh, uh, of our champagne houses or introducing biocontrol solutions so we could get rid of insecticides 
uh, in, in most of our properties or our, our, our estates or using electric tractors so as, uh, of course, not to pollute, uh, especially in France, where we have, uh, we have the benefit of uh, nuclear energy, uh, or also engaging uh, um, the entire regions into becoming more and more sustainable. And of course, we are continuing to grow. And, and I must say, there's a lot of learning we do here and a lot of ideas uh, uh, which you see uh, here on these examples. Uh, um, for instance, we had recently, we put in place a program for our Maison Ruinard, in which we took 40 hectares of the historical vineyard and, um, and, and, uh, and dedicated it to an agroforestry pilot project where we are planting now about 14,000 trees uh, in, and, and uh, it spread across, uh, across four kilometers of edges and 800 square meters of islet, the idea being that we want to create more biodiversity and measure what it will make for the vineyard, which is of course uh, at the core of this. Um, so, so a lot of ideas also on agroforestry projects. And maybe let me highlight uh, one or two of these projects. Um, one I'm, I'm particularly uh, excited about is the project around Chateau Galoupé. Chateau Galoupé is, a, is a, a wine property in uh, Provence, in the south of France. And uh, it has about 60 hectares of vineyards and 100 hectares of other land. And our idea has been, as we acquired this three years ago, to make this an absolutely benchmarking domain in sustainable development. So of course, going to organic and biodynamic uh, farming, but also testing agroforestry in the vineyard and around it. And then this natural area, which, which surrounds uh, the vineyards, uh, to transform it with the help of the Provence Conservatory of Natural Spaces towards making it a state-of-the-art preservation and biodiversity area using pollinators. And we have been installing hundreds of hives to bring to contribute to this biodiversity in this area. So this is, of course, an experimental project which uh, uh, we want to, to make uh, 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 an example of what we could do in other places and where we really want to go all the way to maximize uh, biodiversity, natural cultivation, and then of course measured result of that and hopefully uh, produce a wonderful rosé wine which uh, will bear the fruit of these um, uh, efforts. Another example I can uh, I will give is uh, uh, with Hennessy. You know that cognac is made out of aging of wine-based eau de vies in barrels produced from oak. So we are big consumers of oaks. We have our own oak forest. But through that, we of course we also know how fragile the forest is. And so Hennessy, the cognac maison, has engaged in massive reforest actions, real foresting actions with Reforest Action and. Uh, uh, a company specialized in reforestation, uh, not just in France, but throughout the world as a contribution to uh, reforestation, to richer ecosystems, and, and also a kind of echo to uh, what we do, namely cognac and, and the, the fact that we've been using for more than 250 years, we have been using oak barrels to, um, to create the best cognacs uh, 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 we can. And lastly, of course, uh, as I said, we are, it's a lot about learning, about studying, about experimenting. And of course, this is uh, one of the objectives of this is to really sharing what we do. And so for the first time last year, we used the uh, wine uh, uh, fair, which is called Vinexpo, which took place in Paris in January. We use it. Uh, we use it by renting a large space, which you see here on the pictures. We invited experts from sustainable winemaking throughout the world. We invited the entire industry. We invited also people who are competitors of us to have a two, three days sharing of best practices, of best developments, so that we can contribute to the whole industry to further develop its knowledge, its ex expertise, and become better and better at managing in a sustainable way our terroirs and that does make sure that for the next hundreds of years it will still be possible to create wonderful wines, spirits, champagnes uh, in our terroirs and thus uh, um, contribute also to the sustainability of the overall environment. 
And that's all from our, my side. I hope uh, it, it, I was able to transmit to you our inspiration, our views. Of course, I'm not a specialist in biodiversity. We, have, we use a lot of specialists. We are, we are still doing a lot to progress every day, but our philosophy is very clear and I hope it was also clear to all of you. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Schaus. And, uh, and thank you for the presentation. I wish we did have more time. Um, one thing I can say is that, of course, the concept of terroir precedes our knowledge of soil biodiversity by several hundred years, but it does enshrine many of the same values of preservation of continuity of soil health. So I think there's some very valuable lessons for all of us to learn from that. Uh, things which were known by, by viticulturalists when they were just farmers and which we are now finding out, I would say more of the science behind it, all of us, uh, but these are very important values for all of us. So thank you once again. Uh, I would like to invite our next speaker, um, who is Mr. Alexander Sharabaika from Fosagro, who will make a presentation on sustainable eco-friendly fertilizers for conservation of soil diversity. Um, Mr. Sharabaika is the deputy uh, CEO for finance and international projects of Fosagro. Over to you, sir. Uh, could I just make one comment, please? Um, we'd like to use the chat box for questions uh, for the speakers for the later session. So perhaps we could close the greeting session because at the moment there are so many questions, so many salutations flooding in, which of course we're very happy to receive. Uh, but it's very difficult to make out any questions. Thank you. So over to you, Mr. Sharabaika. Do we have the speaker online? Yes. Um. Mr. Sharabaita was here, but. Uh, yes, no, I, I can see you. Yeah, we. Okay, please go ahead. Dear colleagues, can you hear yes, me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Please go ahead. Uh, good day, dear colleagues. Uh, let me start. According to the UN, the world's population is set uh, to grow by more than 2 billion by 2050. This will require a significant increase in food production from 8.4 billion tons to 13.5 billion tons a year. Today, one third of agricultural land is degraded. This area uh, and this area continues to grow. At the current rate of consumption and uh, without fertile soil, humanity will not be able to produce enough food. As one of the world's leading uh, producers of uh, mineral fertilizers, we are aware of our responsibility for food safety and for the environment. It is impossible to provide uh, the human population with uh, high quality and affordable food without effective mineral fertilizers. That's why we are working hard to combat nut uh, nutritional deficit and hunger by providing consum consumers in more than 100 countries with high performance plant nutrition systems. Our portfolio currently includes 53 grades of fertilizers, 12 of which contain micronutrients. Today we pay special attention to the science. Fosagra works uh, collaboratively with uh, innovative foundations and specific organizations to develop new products. It's uh, biostimulants, bioactive additives, and nutritional characters. Thanks to the current uh, creation of databases, laboratories for analysis, so uh, anal analyzing soil um, properties and the availability of this information, farmers can carry out ecological sustainable agriculture and make efficient use of resources, including the use of fertilizers in line with the 4R principles. Our fertilizers addresses uh, and inquire a range of challenges, including providing soil, um, uh, preserving soil fertility and providing plant plants with necessary nutrients, while applying environmentally sound soil cultivation technologies and uh, prevent preventing carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, this ensures the companies sustainable development, enabling us even during the pandemic time to increase the production of fertilizers in line with quality benchmarks. 
The latest studies of Russian market confirms that farmers have more confidence in integrated solutions. It is not the seeds, fertilizers, and safety features that are of interest, but products with a minimal ecological footprint that take into account the specific uh, specifics of the soil and climatic me, conditions. Shadabaika. I'm sorry, we can't see a presentation. Did you share your screen? No, we, are, we don't. It's just- Okay, good, just good. A, I was only worried about that. Report. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, the company supports global soil initiatives such as FAO's Global Soil Partnership. We are working with FAO to implement the Global Soil Doctor program, which teaches farmers about sustainable soil management and improving soil fertility. We also support the Global Soil uh, Laboratory Network, Glossolan, in Africa, Latin America, and Middle East. The company is uh, introducing resource and energy saving technologies and is searching for new solutions for the use of uh, chemical industry byproducts. For example, for Sagro technology, for the use of phosphogypsum and road construction in, is uh, included in the International Fertilizer Association Guide for the best practices for the use of a phosphogypsum. We always welcome measures to increase the transparency of our fertilizers production and supply chain. At our initiatives, eco-labels were developed uh, and supports by all members of Russian Fertilizers uh, Producers Association and uh, certify to the ex excellent environmental performance of Russian minimal fertilizer. Uh, this is especially important in view of a historic European Union decision to restrict the sale of fertilizers with high level of harmful heavy metals. To sum up, I would like to say that Fosagro is celebrating to its 20th anniversary this year. During this entire period, environmental protection, human health and sustainable development have uh, remained our priorities. Our philosophy is not only to provide humanity with equality products, but also to conserve nature for the future generation while contributing to the achievement of sustainable development goals. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Sharabaika. Thank you also for having been so prompt in the presentation um, and also for sharing with us that experience. I'm, of course, well aware of the work that Fosagro is doing on reduction of heavy metal contents and monitoring for that. Uh, we've had a long, long history of exchange on technical information with Fosagro on that. So thank you very much. And thank obviously, you. this is a very complex subject, and we're very glad to be engaged with you on that. So thank, thank you once much. again. We may have questions then in the technical session at the end of the, of the thing, of the mini. So um, I'd like to go to the next session here, and I would like to invite um, Martin Johnson of Rabobank, uh, who will be presenting ACORN, which is a program for stimulating smallholder agroforestry at scale. Um, FAO has been in discussions with Martin Johnson for some time around ACORN, so I'm, I'm delighted to invite you back here. Over to you, please. Thank you very much, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever uh, everyone is. I'm very pleased to present on behalf of Rabobank um, a new initiative we've been working on in the, in the past few months. Um, unfortunately, due to Rabo uh, restrictions, I cannot um, uh, access from a computer and therefore I've asked the FAO colleagues to manage the slide. So if you can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Yeah, so what I'm going to present is a new initiative uh, uh, launched by Rabobank, which we call ACORN, which stands for Agroforestry Carbon Removal Units uh, to Organically Restore Nature. And if you can go to the next slide. Um, with this new initiative, we ant uh, anticipate to make a small contribution to uh, a number of very large challenges we are all facing uh, in this world around climate change, land degradation, and ensuring food security in the long run, um, whereby we focus on supporting smallholder farmers in making the transition to agroforestry. If you can go to the next slide. Um, um, so where do we, why do we focus on smallholder farmers? First and foremost, because there's so many smallholder farmers and they manage such a long uh, or such a large um, uh, amount of land jointly um, that we feel that supporting them uh, can, can make a huge contribution. 
also because there's so many people um, dependent on uh, the smallholder farmers uh, for their livelihoods and, and for the supply of their food. Um, going to the next slide, as I said, we'd like to support smallholder farmers in uh, making the transition to agroforestry. And we believe that that is very important for the smallholder farmers for multiple reasons. Um, uh, the, the most important perhaps being uh, to improve the quality of the soil in the long run and ensuring uh, diversity and high quality nutrition, uh, sorry, nutrients. Uh, and increasing the climate resilience of smallholder farmers. We feel that it's very important to state this very clearly that this should be, uh, according to us, the reason for smallholder farmers to make the transition to, uh, to agroforestry and not necessarily the carbon credits that can be generated uh, because we very much believe that these long-term benefits um, should be the driver and, and should also ensure long-term long -term sustainability of these, um, of these projects. At the same time, we do believe that compensating smallholder farmers for the carbon that is being sequestered, and then we're initially talking about carbon being sequestered in the trees, might help in making the transition to agroforestry more financially sustainable. So going to the next slide, um, that is what we try to focus on, is to uh, provide a scalable manner to measure, monetize and market carbon sequestration on behalf of smallholder farmers to create an additional income stream for smallholder farmers to make that transition more financially sustainable and hopefully also to unlock financing to make the transition at scale, realizing that access to finance is obviously a large bottleneck for scaling um, uh, agroforestry for smallholder farmers. Going to the next slide, so what is it that we are working on within Rabobank? We are developing a um, global transparent marketplace to enable smallholder farmers to have access to the carbon market. Uh, whereby we focus on uh, an ecosystem-driven system, meaning that we think it's very important to involve the local stakeholders in the system, and we're building on them to collect data that is being collected anyways already. We're looking to uh, focus on technology to ensure a scalable model to reduce costs as, as much as possible, uh, working with remote sensing data for the measurement of the carbon sequestration, or for the delta and biomass and machine learning for scalable and transparent uh, uh, measurement and, and uh, uh, monitoring. Uh, we've been talking to a lot of potential buyers of the carbon credits or carbon removal units as we call them and believe that there is a, a large demand for high quality credits. And what is considered to be a high quality credit is a credit that focuses on actual removal. Uh, that is an actual uh, sequestration that has been taking place. So looking at ex post uh, credits as opposed to ex ante credits where you're selling a future promise, uh, promise of sequestration and um, ensuring transpa uh, transparency uh, and traceability all the way back to the smallholder level. Um, is something that is important and that is uh, what we have been implementing in this system to, to ensure uh, uh, that there is a market for those credits. So going to the next slide, what would such a proposition look like and how, how would the ACORN proposition work? On the one hand side, you have the smallholder farmers uh, making the transition to agroforestry. What is not mentioned on, uh, on this slide, but what is very important is that those uh, smallholder farmers work with local intermediaries and those intermediaries could be local cooperatives, could be NGOs, could be traders that work with those farmers on a regular basis and can support those farmers in um, making the transition, ensuring that there's local resources available to, to support and monitor uh, whether the trees will remain in the ground, for, uh, for example, but more importantly, to ensure that the agroforestry design meets the local needs of a farming community, um, ensuring that, that we're using 
local trees that are preferred by the by the farmers and where there's a market for for the produce if there is any produce coming from the trees. The intermediaries will, on behalf and with the consent of the farmers, collect data for the uh, of the farmers that will be used to onboard the smallholder farmers onto the platform. And the most important data point there is the GPS polygons of the farmers. And in addition to that, we'll collect, uh, need to collect some socioeconomic data where we try to align that as much as possible with data that will be collected anyways to increase efficiency and also increase the quality of the data points. Um, the GPS polygons are obviously a very important point, and on the basis of that, we will measure the delta in biomass um, on a year-by-year -year basis, and that will be translated into a carbon removal unit that will be sold to corporates looking to offset their carbon emissions, whereby we find it important to uh, work with buyers or potential buyers that are first and foremost looking to reduce their emissions and only then look at offsetting the remaining emissions. We're currently looking to uh, sell those credits at a minimum price of uh, $20 per ton. And we've done a first uh, small proof of concept with Microsoft, who's been uh, a, a buyer of uh, the initial credits. The payment will be done uh, through uh, Acorn, uh, whereby Rao maintains a 10% margin to cover our costs, including the measurement as well as the certification. And the remainder will be paid out to the intermediary for the benefit of the farmers. So as I mentioned, what is super important in this proposition is scale. And therefore we're uh, strongly uh, looking at remote sensing data for the me uh, measurement of the carbon sequestration or the, the bio delta and biomass. Uh, going to the next slide, uh, we've been uh, starting with a, a number of proof of concept with a number of organizations to, to test the quality of remote sensing based measurements of um, smallholder agroforestry systems. But at this point in time, the accuracy levels of that are not um, high enough. So in order to further enrich the algorithms and to improve the quality of, of the, uh, the algorithm, so the confidence levels and the accuracy. Uh, we've been collecting and are on, on an ongoing basis collecting the ground truth data to further enrich those algorithms. Um, and we expect that over time we will reduce the amount of ground truth data that is required to uh, reach uh, the, the levels of confidence uh, and still uh, provide a scalable solution. Um, and uh, that is based on basically the developments of those algorithms, but at the same time also the development of the remote sensing technology uh, that, are, that uh, is currently going on uh, and still ongoing. So uh, with this, we hope to provide um, um, a first scalable solution for compensating the smallholder farmers for uh, some of the payment or so, some of the ecosystem services. Uh, being the carbon being sequestered in the trees, but we see this as a first step. And hopefully over time, we'll be able to compensate those same farmers for more of the ecosystem services, such as soil sequestration or, or larger biodiversity. Um, we're very much looking forward to work with uh, partners that are on the ground working with smallholder farmers and supporting them in making the transition to agroforestry and seeing if we can make that transition even more financially uh, uh, sustainable and interesting by providing an additional income stream for the farmers. Thank you very much for your time and um, I'm wishing you a, a pleasant uh, continuation of the symposium. Thank you very much for that intervention. Very dense, very specific. I've received several questions in the chat uh, asking about when we can find the symposium materials. I suspect that many people want to study your presentation in great detail. Uh, so I'm asking my colleagues in the secretariat maybe to publish a response in the chat box about where they can find uh, all the materials from, uh, from all the presentations. Um, I'm looking now to see if our next speaker is here. Um, uh, Mr. Funabashi, are you here? 
I cannot see. Oh, yes, yes. Okay, welcome. So I would like to invite our, our next speaker, Mr. Masatoshi Funabashi from Sony CSL, uh, who will present uh, Cineculture on Cynical Culture and Human Augmentation of Exos. Exo Excuse me, this is a tongue twister. Clinical Culture and Human Augmentation of Ecosystems, uh, a project overview of their work. Um, Dr. Funabashi, uh, the floor is yours. Oh yes, thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. And just um, trying to find how to share my screen. Yes, I think I got it. Can you look at the presentation now? Yes, we can see that, thank you. All right, um, thank you for the introduction. And I'm a researcher at Sony Computer Science Laboratories and I'm working on the project on um, sustainable agriculture uh, that is called Cineco Culture. Um, just briefly, I had, this is just 10 minutes presentation. So this is just the overview of our project. And my concern is uh, how to recover the, the great loss of diversity, um, bi biological diversity. And we are living in the six mass extinction and there's so many scientific reports that are uh, citing the agricultural uh, land use change as the massive driver of such a uh, huge loss of uh, diversity. But um, in reality, um, these activities called agriculture is not confined in, in just you know, large scale practices that we see um, in the media. It's more like there are many, many uh, small holders working uh, as a reality of food production that, that is still producing like uh, about half of the world food. And these people are uh, also owing massively on the loss of biodiversity. And here is uh, some um, statistics that are aggregated to explain the situation. Uh, you can see the reference if you want to know the detail. So uh, my project is trying to tackle these small holders uh, that is uh, left a bit behind uh, of the development of uh, aid or you know uh, scientific initiatives and business in incentives are uh, actually leaving these people uh, behind, and that is not good for for the biodiversity. So uh, the cynical culture concept is to create it. Uh, um, a very small but biodiverse ecosystem. So here, this is the first experimental plot in Japan. Um, this is just 1,000 square meters, but on which uh, we associated more than 200 edible uh, plant species, so including vegetables, uh, herbs, uh, fruit trees, and many more, including medicinal herbs, for example. And um, we are uh, uh, based on the association, the mixed association of these uh, edible crop species. Sorry, Dr. And, Dr. Funabashi, excuse me, could I ask yes. you to put it on full screen, your presentation? It would be easier to see. All right, it is fine now. Uh, no, we're still seeing there. Perfect. Thank you very much. All right, yeah, there's time difference because I'm just talking uh, from Tokyo, Japan. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> the concept of this project is to uh, replace or the external uh, input like uh, tillage, fertilizers, and, and agrochemicals um, by the self-organizing process of ecosystem. And that was my PhD specialty in complex system science. So there are many species interacting here that are forming a rich function of ecosystem, including material cycles. And, and these complex systems can replace all this external uh, input. And well, that was a hypothesis and we, we are testing that. And this is just the example of the harvest that we have. So it's very different from the conventional supermarket product. It can take various forms, but um, they are quite uh, nutritious. If we looked at the, the food component, actually, we measured that. And also it's very colorful. And, and in terms of food diversity, uh, it can produce a very high variety of these food stuff. Yeah, so this is the um, <clears throat> intuitional um, uh, intuitive concept on how the systems is increasing the biomass and how it reaches the, the underground uh, ecosystem as well. So we have this uh, concept of natural ecological succession that is well known in the field of ecology, but uh, such a natural formation is not very productive as agriculture. So we are trying to replace as many species as 
possible add the species that could uh, dominate the system as useful crop species. So the upper right uh, state is something that we uh, call the augmented ecosystem that is uh, far more useful, uh, including economic and ecological values compared to the natural um, ecosystems. Yeah, and this is the scientific background that I created um, to evaluate uh, the productivity. Um, I cannot explain details, but um, this theory integrate the monoculture productivity and the mixed polyculture productivity, such as sinecoculture. And these two uh, ways of producing um, edible biomass, it's not contradicting, it's just a matter of the different uh, functions um, um, in, in terms of the difference of the environment and in terms of the difference of biodiversity response. But um, to, to be uh, short, and this theory indicates that the system, the complex system such as sinecoculture, can perform very well in rather hard environments like in, in uh, dry land agriculture, um, rather than you know, uh, rich um, environment like in Japan. So I brought this system to Sub-Saharan Africa, um, principally at Burkina Faso. Uh, we have the transition from uh, Sahara Desert to uh, a more humid uh, savannic formation there. But uh, the land we studied is just uh, abandoned land because of the um, inappropriate practices of, of traditional agriculture. Well, that's the term they were using. So basically, the monoculture methods are depleting soil, and they abandoned this land, and on which we actually reintroduced 150 edible old species through the methodology of sinecoculture. And the result we got was after one year of introduction of these uh, species and just adding water, no fertilizer, no chemicals, we had a transition from left to, to right, actually. And uh, the right forest actually uh, made of crops, we can uh, just cut and uh, sell on the, on the market. And in terms of the soil, of topsoil formation, it was also significant. That's you can see uh, on the left, the initial condition, and this is almost sand. There's no organic matter actually. And to the right uh, side, we have a rich developed porous st structure, and we couldn't actually uh, measure uh, um, soil component and soil microbiology in Africa. But uh, as we measured in Japan, um, the natural development of such uh, structure, including my microbiological profiles, were very significant and even exceeding the best um, profile in conventional agriculture. Yeah, and we had a very rich harvest um, in Burkina Faso, which was uh, providing a high impact to address poverty, malnutrition, and also to increase the security by providing uh, decent work. And uh, here it's just a summary, but you can look at the, the proceedings of our international symposium that is showing the data, that is showing the statistics, and how um, this system could be beneficial uh, in the global scale as well. Yeah, so <clears throat> um, the local government uh, joined the movement, and also we had the support of, of UNESCO, and we uh, just uh, held uh, five times uh, symposia on Africa Jones site. Um, yeah, I'm mostly inviting uh, uh, peoples from Saharan countries. And now, um, this is actually the map of this year. We have um, basically uh, three main projects and also um, personal uh, projects that is scattering um, around the project. And you can see on in the middle uh, that there are farms uh, supported by Sony that is operating as a demonstration farm. And on the left, uh, for example, we had the uh, ECOVAS uh, budget on the support of agriculture technology. And so this is a kind of international project. And we are creating uh, several dozens of, of farms bottom up uh, in this region. And we are also uh, providing high impact on the local productivity and especially this uh, uh, um, points with red points are actually classified as uh, very 
a dangerous zone because there are so many terrorists and sometimes the villages are wiped away. But in such situation, we are continuing the production and try to uh, um, augment the livelihood of the people. And this initiative is well accepted by, by local people and local government as well. And on the uh, right downside, uh, we have another uh, national project from, from Togo's uh, Republic government. And it is actually uh, using the rescue fund of COVID-19. So um, here we are creating a 30, 30 hectare of uh, silicocaccia farm to train 2,000 people and eventually distribute the products to, to some million people in, in these regions. All right, you can also see uh, on the Facebook uh, some pictures of our uh, um, local NGO that uh, I established with the, the local collaborators, CAFs, and you can just search that on Facebook and you will see some pictures that is growing now. And okay, um, the reason why I hold this project at Sony Computer Science Lab is that uh, such complex ecosystem require a lot of information. So the management uh, of ecosystem requires big data. Uh, sometimes um, the very complex analysis on artificial using artificial intelligence. So this is a, uh, the overview of the system that we are developing in the team, and we are trying to provide as open source. This um, system is still under uh, development that we are gradually trying to introduce and do the proof of concept on site, including Sub-Saharan Africa. And here is uh, one example um, on this complex network. Uh, we visualize the, the uh, ecological interaction between different uh, plant species that we introduced uh, on the site. And from this uh, analysis, uh, we could see that uh, there are hub pollinators that we should actually uh, um, protect and expect to, to increase the harvest. Uh, so we notify to local farmers that if you find these uh, species, and um, this has a high possibility that they are serving as potential hub pollinators on your, uh, on your uh, farm. So this is a good sign. And so we are uh, making um, these sort of suggestions according to the analysis of the ecological interactions. So here is another example of suggestion. It, on the left side, we have uh, the analysis of already introduced species and which plant uh, species. So these are crops. Uh, acting as the hub of ecological interactions. So we have to uh, probably increase the dominance of this species uh, to better have the stability of the sinicoculture field. And on the right side, these are examples of plant species that uh, haven't yet uh, been introduced in, the, in our farm, but which according to the ecological interaction analysis has a high potential that it could serve as hub species. So very highly functioning species. Yeah, so that's the end of my presentation. And um, we uh, had 10 years of research, um, scientific research activities uh, on the cynical culture uh, project. And this April, uh, we found, well, the Sony group funded the cynical company. Um, and I'm serving as president now. And we are trying to provide uh, the services related to, to the uh, management, assessment, and also the augmentation of biological diversity, principally starting from cynical culture, but um, any projects that goes in line with this uh, philosophy, the human augmentation pro uh, of ecosystems. And this means that uh, with the assistance of human, um, the ecosystems, which may be uh, not natural anymore. So the Anthropocene ecosystem could be more biodiverse than the past um, ecosystem without human. So thank you very much. And here's the reference, and you can see uh, the overview of the, the concept from, from this perspective article from Nature Research. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Wanabashi. Uh, could you unshare your screen? Excellent. So thank you very much. Um, we have a very, very short time available, but first of all, I want to thank all of the four speakers. Um, we've had a pretty broad range of interventions here, just to look at it. We've looked at uh, very traditional but evolving modern concepts from one of, if not the world's premier wines and spirits producers, Moet Tennessee. Uh, we've looked at one of the world's largest producers of phosphates, which is engaged in an important transformation now. Uh, one of the most cutting edge programs on 
uh, soil carbon market transformations uh, through, through uh, Rabobank and the ACORN project, and a very interesting technical presentation on cynical culture. Uh, great deal of complexity. Now, obviously, there are many, many initiatives out there. The idea was to give you a bit of a glimpse of how many things are happening in the private sector uh, that we often don't notice. Um, maybe one question that we really have 10 minutes left. Uh, they came up many times in the chat box, and I would really like to toss out maybe to all four of the speakers in sequence just for a quick question, is how can we promote and accelerate investments on soil health? This is something which is coming from all of your sectors. You're all big actors in this. Uh, maybe I could, I could start just very quickly uh, with, with Mr. Schaus. Uh, over to you. Uh, do we have Mr. Schultz with us? Maybe he's dropped off the line. I don't see him here. Okay, maybe I could go to um, Mr. Sharabaika, over to you. Hello, colleagues. So yes, this is quite an important issue. And so we understand that uh, only combined efforts together of international organizations and private sector can support to, prom to, to promote them. Uh, sustainable land use and to maintain the soil, soil quality and fertility. Uh, simultaneously, we understand, yes, the uh, combined efforts, so science-based approach is also very important for us. So we are working together with um, uh, Russian Academy of Science, for example, and with international organizations, international institutions to promote the sustainable soil, soil management. Uh, it should be always uh, very smart and innovative because in some areas we have uh, significant degradation of the soil cover. And in this case, farmers there cannot produce enough food for, even for themselves and doesn't matter if we want to, to feed anybody else. So in this case, we have uh, together by and uh, also we uh, support biodiversity on the um, different, uh, uh, different land plots in different regions of the world, uh, especially if we're speaking about the, the tropical areas where the biodiversity is much higher compared to the, to the, to the Northern Hemisphere where we are located, for example, like from our company in, um, in Russia together. So we, are, we understand that this is like a boom and we need to, uh, to be very, Mm, proactive to talk to the to, to the to the users of our product to talk to the to the farmers to speak to them speak to them share the information and this is also quite an important aspect that is sharing of information so teach people if you know anything new so share this information so this webinar and uh, these platforms are very important to share the information Great, thank you very much, Mr. Sharabaika. Um, pulling another question out of the box here. Um, there was an issue about, the, um, about the, the ACORN project and there was some concern about the fact of resources flowing through intermediaries to farmers and to know maybe more about how uh, the project ensures that the bulk of the resources coming from this um, does in fact flow to, to the farmers themselves and not get intercepted. Um, Martin, over to you. Yeah, uh, very quick. Good and, and relevant question, obviously. And uh, what we envision to do and what we're, we're currently working on is to see if we can work with uh, different parties to ensure traceability of payments all the way up to the farmers. Um, in the ideal situation, we would do that through, for example, digital wallets of the farmers. And in certain, uh, uh, some of, of the pilots that we're currently doing, we're actually testing that so that the payment goes directly into a wallet of uh, the farmer and we can actually tra track how much is, is then uh, coming to them. At the same time, we do think it's important to ensure a uh, ecosystem that makes sense for all parties involved. So it might be that from that wallet, there will be a, a deduction for some of the costs that intermediaries, for example, have made in terms of purchasing uh, saplings um, um, in bulk to reduce costs. So, so that is one. We do see, however, that in some of the pilots that we started, uh, there's no possibility yet to make a digital payment or, or to create a digital wallet. And in these cases, we um, uh, uh, ask the intermediaries to confirm the payment 
uh, to the farmer to ensure that that has been uh, paid up to the level of the farmer and do some cross-checking with text messages and, and calling on a uh, 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 basically um, and not every every farmer, but uh, a certain percentage of the farmer to cross check and validate uh, the actual payment. Great, thank you very much. I'm well aware of, of call center uh, procedures. They're not easy. We use them in many cases ourselves. Um, one last question I'd like to ask to to Mr. Fonabashi that came from the text box. Um, there was there seemed to be a focus primarily on local, um, but not commercially grown crops. So more either lost varieties or so on. Um, is there a discussion of also scaling this up, this approach to commercially commercially viable crops? Oh, sure. Well, actually, it depends on the regions and the available crops, of course. And in Japan, uh, we have the, the um, seed genetic resources, uh, mostly dominated by a few uh, seed companies. Well, I'm not criticizing it. I'm just in talking about the reality. So it's quite difficult to um, find something other than the F1 seed. While in African countries, what we discover is that there are are still so many uh, varieties of local seeds that are vigorous and that are very adaptive to sinoculture situation. And we also have very um, um, high variable crops like cacao or sesame or other moringa trees that are growing well in our system as well. So um, yeah, our company is not um, producing these crops, but we are providing consultation um, to to uh, inform people how to introduce this system and how can they be profitable at the same time increasing local biodiversity. So if uh, there's anyone interested, just contact me and uh, we can discuss on how we can set up the, the uh, commercial farms on site in any place in the world. Great, thank you very much. So we've pretty much run out of time and I do wanna keep on schedule. Um, I do want to thank everybody from the number of questions we've received. We could have probably gone on for a couple of hours here, uh, but I would encourage people. Uh, all of these programs, as you know, have websites, have programs. Please do contact them. Please dig in. There's a lot more. Um, and of course, bear in mind that what we've introduced today is a small number of, of private sector actors who have volunteered their time and their enthusiasm to be with us today. It is a huge range out there. This is a, a key message that we're trying to say we must engage with the private sector uh, most of the action happening is happening thanks through the private sector in terms of achieving the SDG. So uh, please do reach out through us or through them. Um, we're just about right on time. I'm handing back here to Ronald, I believe, over to you. Thank you very much, Alexander. It was an excellent moderation on a session in which we wanted to to of course show that the private sector is also engaged in the cause of healthy soils, which for us is very important. I hope we will be able to answer the questions because that's something we will do when reporting. And now we will move into the parallel, se parallel session. So technically I will hand over to my colleague Isabel who will explain in detail how these uh, parallel sessions will work, but I want to thank also all the presenters and to you, Alex, for the great session. Isabel, please, can you tell our great participants, more than 2,000 people, how to reach the different se parallel sessions that we have? Thank you very much again. Many thanks, Ronald and Alexander. Well, um, for the next two hours, we will all sit into six different parallel sessions, structure around 90 presentation. You can switch between parallel sessions as many times as you like and attend the presentation that interests you the most. I'm not sure who participated in our past physics soil symposium here in FAO, but the overall spirit is just the same. You simply move from one meeting to another in total freedom. Remember that your camera will be on, but you will not be able to unmute yourself. If you want to intervene, raise your question on the chat as the moderator will select some key questions and open the discussion. Now, how to enter the parallel session? You can refer to the email that was sent to you recently with the subject attending the symposium. It contains a lot of details on how those four days are organized. Just keep that email handy. The alternative is to simply enter the symposium website 
my colleagues are right now posting on the chat uh, the URL. Let me share my screen quickly. So I will guide you through. Okay, so you can see here uh, on, on the screen um, the, the home page of the symposium. So you just need to click, click here, join the symposium, and uh, click on the different parallel sessions. So if you see when I move, um, when I roll over parallel session one, it you click directly and you enter the parallel session. Use that passcode here because each different parallel session has its own passcode. Agenda of the parallel session um, is also available directly from the home page. You have it here, a downloadable PDF and a virtual format also. Um, finally, a uh, few more things because I saw a lot of requests on the chat uh, regarding certificates of attendance. Uh, please note that certificates will be granted, uh, distributed, prepared upon participation to the four days of the symposium. Just send us a, a message on the SOB mailbox if you need one, and uh, we will check the participating log and prepare them accordingly. Also, don't forget to check the GSOB website regularly as we are currently uploading all presentation and recording all those day session. I hope everything is clear. We'll now all meet directly in the parallel session. Many thanks um, to all of you and uh, see you there.